A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily's My Favorite Case. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. You know, we always say that everyone in the world of true crime has a story to tell about a case that they either worked or that they lived through. Some are high profile, some you've never heard of, but they are all fascinating. Today's crime case happened almost 20 years ago in Conway, Arkansas, where two men, Carter Elliott and Timmy Robertson, were found shot to death in a suburban home. With us today are... Ashley Elliott and Michael Cofino. Ashley is the daughter of Carter, and she recently published a book about her years long journey in the pursuit of justice for her parents. And Michael is the co author of the book, which is called Demon in Disguise. We welcome you both to the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do want to make clear that even though this series is called My Favorite Case, Ashley, I want to be very respectful toward you. I, I want to share my condolences. I'm very sorry for everything that happened to your father, to your family, the trauma that you've lived through. So clearly this is not your favorite case. We, we just want to explain to everyone that when we um, first started talking to Michael, the author about this, why he was so fascinated about this case, that was the perspective. And then he said, you know, Ashley would love to join us, to which we thought, absolutely we want to hear a survivor's story. So uh, I just want to make that clear to everyone that we are sensitive here to you, Ashley. Um, welcome. And Michael, um, we, we, um, I, I've worked with your sister. It's a pleasure to meet you. So, Likewise. so let's dig in a little bit because I, I think, you know, the, the demon in disguise to me, I presume has to be the killer here. Is that correct? Yes. The killer, Ralph Richard Conti. So I'm just going to give everyone a very simple summary, and then we're going to get into it because there are a lot of players here. Ultimately, what ended up happening is that actually your father was murdered by a man who had been married to your mother after your parents divorced. Very briefly married to this man, a very obsessive, controlling emergency room doctor who not only kills your father, but then one month later kidnaps your mother. Mm -hmm. So the, the level of trauma that you suffered through is, is horrific. And we're going to get into the details as to how some things were missed and 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 did he come up on the radar early on? Michael, from your perspective, um, what is it about this case that is like none other that you've ever covered? That's an interesting question. Um, well, frankly, I'll tell you what it is. It's Ashley. Um, Ashley was the ideal client for Ghost Rider. Um, she was incredibly transparent and brutally honest, sometimes to a fault. I think she would agree with that. Um, and notwithstanding how uh, strongly she felt about the experience, she was open to my feedback on her perspectives that she had formed emotionally over the course of two decades. For example, you know, I might try to explain to her how the participants in the criminal justice system you know, saw things and why they did things the way they did, which normally victims of crimes aren't gonna appreciate right away. But she was um, consistently receptive. And so for me, what was fascinating was not just the, the story, but the opportunity to work with a special person like Ashley. And Ashley, for you, you know, I a lot of times we've had survivors on this program to talk about working through either the crime that they survived or or happen to a family member of theirs, and they then write a book or tell a story in a way um, which is processing it all over again was what was this process like for you uh it wasn't processing it all over again because i didn't know all the aspects of each individual crime um it was more processing new information like what my dad did four days before he was murdered um the details 
of uh, the the crime scene, um, the review of the court transcript. So when I first went through everything, when my father and Timmy Wayne were murdered, you know, that's one separate event and it's very blurry um, because you're very traumatized. So you're going through that. And then to be able to go back um, and have all of the things that the criminal justice system had and to be able to put it in a logical format, you know, that's just a whole new way to approach it, to think about it, um, to put all the pieces together. Cause one, it's like a movie and the other one, it's on a piece of paper. That's the actual events that happen. So it's just two different ways of processing things. Ashley, how old were you when your father was murdered? Uh, 25. Wow. That's still a very young person, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> a young adult, but that's a lot. And then to deal with the additional trauma of you've just lost your father and then your mother is kidnapped it has to be the most frightening thing ever. I mean, I remember my dad died when I was very young and all I ever feared was something would happen to my mother. And no matter what your age Everyone can understand that fear when you lose a parent. Oh, yeah. So it was essentially like, you know, you have this beautiful, I wouldn't say I had a beautiful life, but <laughs> to you, it's a beautiful life. And somebody just comes along and like takes everything that you know in your life and just kind of rips it out from underneath you, not once, you know, and then just a whole nother second time because you're haven't even dealt with losing your father. And now there's this, oh my gosh, now my mother. And just that is, it's almost unfathomable. It really is. It really is. I, I'm just going to do a, a little bit of the detail and to catch everyone up to the original murder. And then if the two of you can walk us through the next things that, that happen. So, um, we are referring to uh, the killer here, the convicted killer and kidnapper here is Dr. Dick Conte. Again, a very unstable emergency room physician married to your mother for what, something like 90 days, right. which I, you know, that pretty much tells you everything you need to know right there um, mm -hmm. that something was wrong. So very briefly married. So on May 18th of 2002, Police in Conway, Arkansas, receive a 911 call that two people had been shot to death in a private residence. When police arrived, they found two men lying face down, dead. They had been shot in the back of the head. They were also they also found a baseball cap with a single 45 caliber round inside. The victims were identified as a prominent local businessman, Carter Elliott. That is Ashley's dad, and his. Uh, protege, Timmy Wayne Robertson. However, police were at a standstill. There were no eyewitnesses. Nobody had heard anything unusual and really no fingerprints. And back then in 2002, DNA was still, um, you know, in its infancy. The result of the autopsies painted a very disturbing picture. Both men had been shot while lying face down, meaning they had been placed in this position execution style and then murdered. Police started looking all, you always look at the people around you, the people closest to you. Ashley, can you give me an idea of, so the home that they were murdered in, was this your father's residence or were, was this somewhere else? Where we lived. This is my home, our family home uh, before my parents got divorced. So we had lived there, you know, for a few years. So it was my home. Horrific. Where were you at the time, Ashley? Uh, I live uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah. So I was out finishing up, you know, college and about to get married and start my own life. And where was your mother living at the time? Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay. So your parents had divorced mm -hmm. and then your mom had married um, Dr. Conte for a very short period of time and then divorced. Correct. From, from your perspective, Ashley, who was Dr. Conte in your life initially? <laughs> it was just my mom's husband. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I, he was awkward. Uh, he was, I mean, weird, um, goofy in physical appearance. And I, I, I it's, I don't want to talk 
ill of him, but he just was he like stuck out in a crowd. You know, he dressed in like military fatigue sometimes, or and he always had this hat on and he looked like a, a grown man dressed up like a boy scout. So, so Ashley, I have to ask you, what did your mother Lark see in this man? Did you say like, mom, like, you know, who is this guy? What are you doing with him? Mm, you know, um, my mom's an adult and uh, she's more than capable of making her own choices and decisions. And I'm sure that I did ask her those questions, um, but respected her decision on what she wanted for herself and her life. And I chose to just play along. Mm -hmm. No, understandable. It's, it's, you know, we all make our individual um, decisions under, understood. So Michael, initially here you have a very prominent businessman, a family man in a great neighborhood where there isn't this kind of crime. What did cops initially think they had on their hands? I think they didn't know, frankly, because you alluded earlier to the absence of uh, evidence, uh, no fingerprints, you know, no eyewitnesses, no noise, nothing that would indicate who might have done it. And to their credit, law enforcement spent, you know, the better part of a month um, uncovering as much as they could. They actually wound up with several theories and which we describe in detail in the book, uh, but they admitted they were stumped um, because none of the theories produced a suspect. Um, while there were some interesting leads and some pretty intriguing stories that people were telling about Mr. Carter and his lifestyle, none of them panned out in terms of, of you know, what well, well, motive might have been there, but none of them panned out in terms of anyone who looked likely to have done it. So after after a month, um, they were completely um, without any direction. And, and it was unclear what was going to happen at that point. Michael, when did the break in the case actually come? The break in the case, and you know, Ashley will live this, uh, occurs when her mother goes missing in Utah. Okay, so let's let's go to Ashley. So your father has now he's been murdered. Um, it's been a month. Ashley, how did you receive this news? How did you take this news? Did you have any immediate suspects in on your list? For the murder of my father? Yes. Uh, my initial reaction when my mother came to my apartment in Salt Lake uh, to tell me was, where's Dick? And I wanted to know where he was. I uh, repeatedly asked her. Um, she reassured me that he was at his cabin in Duck Creek, Utah. I had asked my mom to please phone him. I wanted confirmation that he was there. And my mom did give me that confirmation that he was there. Um, so that was my initial gut reaction was, where is Dick? Um, so Ashley, Ashley, did you share with the police your, your fears and your suspicions that Dr. Dick Conte was number one on your list of suspects? I did not because my mom reassured me that he was at his cabin in, in Duck Creek. So that kind of alleviated my, my concern and my doubts. Uh, any worries I had. Um, so then it just kind of went on to uh, business partners, uh, people who may or may not have liked my dad. Um, I didn't live in Conway, so I really wasn't aware of all the relationships that my dad had. Um, I just knew of, you know, close friends. Um, so I, I didn't really have anybody at the, at the top. So then, Ashley, the, the, the break in the case comes when your mother is reported missing. How did you discover your mother was missing and walk us through that whole thing? What happened there? Uh, I, I was actually in Conway, Arkansas, where my dad lived at the time working on my dad's estate and kind of wrapping those things up. And um, somebody had called me to let me know that my mom did not show up for work. And my mom is not the type of person who isn't going to just not show up for work or not call. Um, she's just so routine. Um, so I tried to call her. Um, I called the police 
um, to notify them. And that was a difficult process as well because she's a grown woman <laughs> and just not showing up for work is not um, that, you know, I don't want to say big of a deal, but you know, for me, it was a big deal. Um, so I talked to the police. I like, this is what she does every morning. She runs from her home to the workout center to back home. Maybe somebody grabbed her, you know, you have all these thoughts going through your head and kind of something that stuck out was that uh, Dick had always told me um, that of course he loved my mother and he cared about my mother. And if anything ever happened to her to contact him, um, so I, I kind of set out to find him. I called the hospital and where he worked and he had not shown up for work that day. So um, I called him, my, where's my mother? And we had this back and forth about where my mother is. And he asked me to calm down and not call the police and had told me that my mom had murdered a man in Park City, had sex with him. He was giving her money and driving her to the border. And I screamed and yelled at him um, and, and hung up and then called the police again um, to notify him that he had my mom. I mean, he had my mom. And did they take you seriously this time? <laughs> uh, kind of. I mean, I had to, I feel like I had to convince them to go into her apartment. Um, I had to convince them to look, are her, you know, is their bed made? Are there dishes left? Because my mother is, my mother's neat and tidy and organized. Um, and no, nothing in there was like my mother would have left it. Um, I called the uh, 911 for Douglas County, uh, got connected with them, um, explained the whole thing to them. I didn't know Dick's address uh, in Douglas County. I just knew that he lived on some piece of land out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> I should have known his address, but I didn't know his address. So right. I convinced them that he was there and he had my mom and he was a dangerous person. He had this fascination with guns, and weapons. I had to tell them, I don't know how many weapons he has, but he's the type of individual that like has hand grenades and, you know, military grade weapons. Um, and they assured me that they would go find her. And I mean, they did find her. How long was it from the time that you, you realized that your mother was missing until they uh, located her? To be honest with you, I can't, I can't put like a time stamp on that. It just, was it a day, two days? It was a day. Yeah. A day. So I got okay. up in the morning. My mom hadn't shown up for work. And by the evening they had her. So it was an all day affair. Okay. So Michael, where was Ashley's mother Lark being held and under what circumstances? What happened? Well, uh, our, our version of the, of the story is that um, he was laying in wait in the condo in, in Utah for her. And, um, and he was dressed in his military garb and he had his weapons uh, and he surprised her and um, basically forced her to uh, go into the room and she, uh, he tied her up and he drugged her and, um, and she passed out eventually. And then he basically um, took her uh, in his truck and they drove to his cabin in Nevada. And um, I do want to just on that point, uh, I, you know, I think we actually got different responses from different jurisdictions. The law enforcement in Salt Lake City was not particularly helpful um, and was very skeptical. Um, and, and Ashley really insisted that they do certain things, which they eventually did. The law enforcement in Nevada was responsive, and um, they, they, they uh, engaged the whole SWAT operation, uh, and I think handled it really well. But um, she was kept captive in Nevada, and he had apparently dug two graves in the backyard. So there was going to be, depending on how off the deep end he was going to go, he had at least considered a, a murder-suicide situation. Um, but eventually he broke down and let her, her mother go and then got arrested. In, in so, so hold on, let me understand this clearly. Um, sure. So, so Ashley, your mother, 
Lark is actually released before the police arrive? Yes, but I didn't know that until Michael and I worked on the book. So I, how I had it visualized was like my mom is crawling on her hands and knees like out of the front door of some cabin that I've never seen before into a vehicle. And that's not what happened at all. So for me to be able to have the details to reconcile the movie inside my head, we, they're just two completely different things. Um, so Michael, what happened? How, how, how was she released? Where did she go? When, how and when did the cops find her? Um, they had, the Nevada uh, law enforcement agencies had pretty much surrounded the community um, looking for um, points of egress so that if he, they were concerned that if he got on the freeway um, with her, it, it, he would be hard to find. And so they were covering all the exits and they, and they dispatched quite a few personnel. In the meantime, he called a nurse colleague of his, who was also a friend who from time to time watched his dogs who he cherished. And um, she came over and at that point with a friend, at that point, he was losing. He was losing it. He, he was giving it up. And he he let um, one of the women take Ashley's mom off the site. And as they were driving out, their car stalled and they got basically accosted by law enforcement. Uh, and, um, and they were, I, think, I don't know if they were handcuffed or not. I think they were handcuffed initially. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, the, the law enforcement continued on to the cabin and he, he walked out. He walked out and basically gave himself up. Um, he, he was just at that point, he was just a completely demoralized man um, and had lost the will to do something more nefarious than he had originally set out to do. So what was his plan with Ashley's mother? What what what? I mean, you think that he was really he was obsessed with her. Was he really going to kill her or was he explaining things to her? Did did he tell um, Ashley's mom, I'm the one who killed, you know, your first husband? What what was going on in that cabin? Well, I'll give you my two cents. Ashley might have a different perspective. I don't think we're ever going to quite know the answer to that. I think that he definitely considered a, a murder suicide. Um I think, and I think obviously he backed away from that. Um, I think he was so emotionally distraught. Um, It was sort of like, if I can't have a no one can kind of attitude. And and I I don't think he had thought it through. I mean, I think the idea that he initially hatched that, you know, um, you know, Ashley's mom had committed a murder and was on her way to Mexico, you know, in exile as a fugitive. Was 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 it really reflective of the, the insanity that was taking grip of his mind? But I don't think he quite knew what he was going to do. Frankly, that's my take on it. Um, at the end of the day, he was an extraordinarily weak man, insecure man, and um, fortunately, he he didn't go the, the extra mile. He denied, by the way, um, to the day of his death, as far as I know, with one exception, uh, a jailhouse confession. Um, that he killed Carter Elliott. He denied it to the police in in Nevada. He he denied it um, uh, uh, when he was extradited. And of course, he defended he defended the case as well. They find a number of interesting things. um, And actually, if I leave something out, please jump in. They find um, first of all, they find photos of Mr. Elliott, which he shouldn't have had because they were never given to him. But apparently he purloin them from the condo in Salt Lake City because he had access to it by the code. So he had taken photos of Carter Elliott because he never met Carter Elliott. So he needed to know what he looked like if he was going to kill him. But they found um, printouts of a map of Conway, the streets. They found uh, a printout of um, radio signals that um, you know that you could u- you could use to find out whether you know where the police were or where where the you know first responders were kind of thing. Um, they found um, a whole cache of weapons, some of which matched the one round 
not 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 forensically match, but you know, in terms of the manufacturing match, the, the round that they found uh, in in the home in Conway. In fact, the bullets that were used were really specialized bullets, very uh, that aren't aren't normally uh, used, except you know, in, in in rare situations and very expensive. Um, they found a magazine which was missing three rounds. Um, or, or one magazine ris- w- w- missing two, another one missing one, which, had, and, you know, there were two shots at the scene plus the one that was one round on the shards that was left there. So they, they began to put together a, really what was a puzzle. They didn't have direct evidence, but they had all these little items that seemed to, you know, could only be explained by the fact that he, you know, he, he was the guy. There were some other issues. I don't know how far you want me to get into this, but there were some other issues having to do with could he have made the trip from Nevada to Conway and back in time? Because he does use his landline on Sunday that night um, at a certain time. I think it was like 930 in the evening, mountain time. Um, and so it looks like a real tight schedule. And so there were issues about what, what transportation he used. Did he have enough time? How could he have done it? You know, what happened to um, uh, the barrel of the gun was this, you know, was probably tossed in the Arkansas River. We don't know that. We suspect that. But there was enough there that they could say, OK, this is starting to add up. So uh, what I'm trying to figure out here is um, why would he want to kill Carter? Well, I, I, because it's not like the woman that he was obsessed with has gone back to her first husband. Oh. What, Ashley, you want, you want to try that one? I mean, I, I could definitely answer that, but I'll defer to Ashley. I'll answer it if I can fill in anything. But at the time, um, I was getting married, and my mom and dad were talking quite often, as they would. They were planning my wedding, um, we had an engagement party um, that both my mom and dad attended and my both my parents drank um, and they frolicked around with each other apparently in the parking lot and reportedly Dick, uh, he was not invited to uh, the party, but he was supposedly in the parking lot um, where my parents happened to make out. And so, you know, I think maybe he considered my dad to be a threat uh, to getting my mom back. He was in the way. Um, I think he was just crazed and obsessed and he would have done anything uh, to get my mom back and, and including murder my father just for some crazy notion that he thought that would win her back, you know, was one less guy in the way. Wow. Yeah. Can, can you give me, Ashley, a time frame of your parents' divorce, then your, your mother marries Dick Conte, and then they divorce, just, and then when the murders happened, what were the spans in between? There's so much time in between. Uh, I was, gosh, in the ninth grade, which would have made me, what, 14 when my parents got divorced and, you know, my mom dated Dick for a very short period of time and, and they married, uh, they had a civil ceremony and then a, and a formal ceremony, if you will, in 2001, uh, my mom and Dick were divorced, I believe it was in April. Uh, yeah. So well, they, did- they, they, were, they, were, they were separated in February. Yeah. So that was 2001 there. They're separated. And in May of 2002, your father is murdered. Yes. So that would have been if there was an incident in addition to, you know, your parents, you know, which frankly, as kids, you, you, you kind of like it when your parents were divorced or making out in the parking lot. on the oh, yeah, of the yeah. Well, of course, you know, <laughs> my parents are fun, fun parents. You know, sometimes they just did parent do wacky things and they weren't married, you know, but as a kid and it was kind of like, it was a joyous celebration and my parents were getting along for once and, you know, that just happened. So I can, can I, can I, can I supplement that a little bit? Oh, please. In the February to May timeframe, Conti is engaged in this, 
insane campaign to try and get Ashley's mom to change her mind. He's, he's, um, he goes over to the house when she's not there, puts flowers and notes everywhere. He's just, he's just constantly trying to win her back. And, and just as much, she's constantly pushing him away. And so his frustration is rising. And then there is this indication, just an indication that maybe Ashley's mom is thinking about getting back with Ashley's dad. Um, and apparently, according to Conti, and I think this actually might be the one thing he said that might be accurate, uh, because there's so many things he said that were just, you know, outside the realm of possibility that he he had found uh, he was opening boxes or something. And he found a we- the wedding gift that Ashley's mom had given him. And one of the one of the themes of his his lament during that period was, how could this happen? How could you be married to someone for 90 days? He was incredulous about that. And then when he found the gift, uh, this is like in May. Um, in the box is when I think he snapped. And with the indication that maybe Carter uh, and Ashley's mom were getting back together, he said, this guy is standing in my way, even though it was clearly a losing battle up to that point anyway. Wow. So then, Michael, at what point is he finally charged with the Uh, murder? What's the year, Ashley? About 15 years later. (laughs) <laughs> crazy what took so long why 15 years to charge him with the murder good question Ashley you want to take that one sure I would love to <laughs> <laughs> you take over when I talk too much um so our first prosecuting attorney uh who was the prosecutor turning at the time of the murders I did not feel that there was enough evidence uh, to have a conviction, uh, although he felt that Dick was the individual who murdered my father. Um, he wrote a letter to our family um, saying he didn't always get along with my dad. They didn't see eye to eye, um, but there just wasn't going to be a snowflakes chance in August that he was going to get a conviction. That's a um, quote. That is Wow. A- Yes, Um, so we got that. Um, He was appointed to a a judge's position, a judge's seat um, in Faulkner County. And his deputy prosecuting attorney, Marcus Vaden, then filled his shoes um, for the next duration. Uh, Marcus held the same beliefs. we sat out, I didn't sit, my mom sat outside Marcus Baden's office all day one day waiting for him to come to work so that she could talk to him. Uh, we would call their office repeatedly trying to get information about where the case was headed, what were they working on, when were there going to be charges filed, and we were ignored, uh, shut down, no response, absolutely nothing. Um, I was approached by Cody Highland, um, who was going to run against Marcus Vaden. Um, Michael, do you know the, trying to think of the year that that happened? I'm, I'm, I'm My, struggling out for the year. Yeah. But maybe. <laughs> so 2007, uh, 2016, 15, that time frame. Okay. It was a little bit before that because it was, um, it, it, it was before that. Yeah. 13. So I'm trying to think. So anyway, uh, Marcus Faden had come up for re-election um, and Cody Highland was set to run against him. Uh, Cody Highland met with my brother and I. He said he was interested in our case. He couldn't make any promises to us. He gave us some more information about some other different cases Um that he just felt that Marcus Faden had made big mistakes on and would be, would we be interested in donating to his campaign and supporting him? And naturally that was a fit for me. So I was on board and uh, donated. 
I called uh, family friends, I called my dad's friends, I called the people who worked for my dad, anybody that I could think of to donate to Cody Highland. Um, I ended up making a commercial for Cody Highland um, that simply was just taken from the newspaper headlines, which was that prosecuting attorney had not done a thing. And um, this prosecuting attorney, Cody Highland, was essentially promising, you know, uh, he wasn't from the good old boy system. Um, and Cody Highland won. Um, so I was very excited, hopeful um, that something would happen. Although, you know, by the two previous prosecutors, I had been reassured like once or twice that I didn't have to worry about anything because Dick was in jail. So there was no possibility that he could hurt us, which isn't really that comforting because uh, in the state of Nevada, you come up for parole and he had been up for parole twice. So I went to his first parole board hearing and it's probably the worst, I can't say it's the worst experience of my life, but it was, it was just kind of shocking. It's very traumatic to sit in front of a panel of people that you've never met before and have to essentially plead your case against uh, somebody who you believed murdered your father, your family friend, and he's serving time for kidnapping your mom. Um, I'm grateful for that panel who chose to keep Dick in jail. He came up for parole uh, a second time. I opted out for that one. My brother and my mother went, and it's the same thing. You Essentially, you're pleading for your life because if, I mean, my belief system is this individual murdered my father, murdered my friends, which means he has a capacity to murder me, my children, my mom, my brother, my brother's children. I mean, the, the effects are just endless, you know, with your mind. Um, so he, my mom would call and keep tabs on Dick, make sure he was still in jail. Um, she happened to call and he was being released early. Um, they just hadn't notified my mom. And so we were very shocked, of course, like, oh my gosh. I mean, that's it. I can't say what I really said, but we notified Cody Highland's office um, and he pressed charges um, against Dick Conti for a uh, double homicide and had him extradited to the state of Arkansas, which he fought the extradition. So, he, so the charges were brought before he was released so they wouldn't have to try and get him as a free man, but literally extradite him through the criminal justice system. Right. Yes. So, okay, so the charges are brought now and, and it's, it's important to remember that while he's been convicted of kidnapping your mother, there are still two murders, not just your father, but there was another man who was murdered. And um, at this, so when he finally gets back to Arkansas to stand trial for the murder charges, what happens? How does, is there a trial or does he plead? What happens? Michael? <laughs> yeah, there, there is, there is a trial and um, it, uh, there's no plea. Uh, it's a normal trial with, with, with the exception that, uh, and Ashley can speak to this, Ashley was not permitted to be in the courtroom. She was barred from the courtroom. Why? Uh, was we, she testifying as a witness? Well, yeah, but so many people were. Um, but that's why you're, I mean, I'm not saying that it's, that it feels good, but most witnesses who testify at trials are not permitted to be in the courtroom. Well, I, not, not before they testify. She wasn't permitted to return to the courtroom. Is it possible that you, I'm again, not defending them by any means, but I just, I've seen that before. That's why it's, it's cruel. Our criminal justice system. Is no, but it was, it, it was, it was applied to Ashley specifically because they were concerned that she would lose it in the courtroom and generate uh, too much uh, empathy in, in the minds and hearts of the jurors. And the prosecution was concerned um, about allowing that to become a, an issue for appeal. Um, remember now, the case was built on circumstantial evidence. There was no direct evidence at all. 
So they had their work cut out for them. And I, by the way, I should I should say that the, the prosecutorial team did a really good job of putting together the evidence and, and creating the storyline that persuaded the jurors. But, you know, Ashley did lose it initially when she first went up to the, to the witness stand and she had to take a break. But um, after that, she after she testified, uh, she was not permitted back. In fact, she was put down the hall in a conference room with a baby monitor so she could listen to the testimony and the arguments on the baby monitor. Oh, brother. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it was a four, four day trial, I think. Uh, and the jury deliberated for about 45 minutes. Wow. So was that. Do you feel that you got justice, Ashley? Um, no, I don't. I don't have my dad. I don't have my family. Um, I got justice in the way that the justice system provides victims justice. I got a lesson in life um, about how the judicial system works. Um, no, I don't think I got justice. I don't know what I got. Dick died um, in jail. And I'm not sure that's justice either, but I'm not living in fear for my life anymore. I'm not living in fear for my children's life anymore or my brother and his wife and his kids or my mom. So I, that's alleviated. Mm -hmm. And in this whole process, this, the second part now with the trial, is there anything um, he maintained his innocence the whole time. Was there anything more that came out about either the how and again, the why he did it? Michael? That's an interesting question, uh, Anna. Um, I think the one thing that was very, I found c captivating was the issue I alluded to earlier about how he made the trip. Um, there was an expert witness who the defense called who testified about the different routes he could have taken and the mileage and how fast you would have to go and all that sort of thing. Um, and the, the, one of the questions, there was an assumption made by the prosecution and law enforcement that Dick had taken his diesel truck to make the trip. Um, but there was a but during the trial, it became, um, I wouldn't say it was evident, but there was a, a looming suggestion that maybe he didn't take the diesel truck, that he took a Jeep. And part of the reason would be that a diesel truck, once if he had really figured out when to get to Conway uh, and how to get out quickly. And the last thing he needed was to make noise, which a diesel truck would have done. So he didn't want to bring any attention to himself. Um, plus, he knew... He, he tried to create an alibi with the diesel truck because he, he did something to its um, mechanisms. I forget exactly what it was now. And he had to bring it into the shop. So when the murders occurred the next day, the, the diesel truck was in the shop. And so his alibi was like, how could I have driven to Arkansas or my diesel truck? It was disabled. But one thing that, that came out of the trial, which was new, was that uh, – the diesel truck could have been used for part of the trip, towing the Jeep. And then he could have, towing the Jeep, and he could have put the diesel truck outside of Conway somewhere, rode the Jeep into town quietly, did the deed, drove back, hooked it up again, and, and, and the route he could have taken was sufficiently, I wouldn't say it's short because it was a, it's a long trip. That he, and he also, by the way, apparently was, was, uh, had a, some amphetamines so that he could have taken amphetamines to stay awake the whole time uh, and make the trip in the time uh, allotted. So that was the one thing about the trial that I think was more clearer than it was in, during the investigation. So Dick Conte was sentenced to life in prison. As you said, he died while in prison in 2017. Was that the impetus then to write this book? Or had no. you started already? No, I hadn't started already. Um, I went through another round 
of um, another dance with the same judicial system, with the same people, um, the same prosecuting attorney who is now a judge. Uh, he was my judge. Dix, criminal defense attorney, was defending another person and I was required to be deposed by him. So I had gone through four years, same criminal justice system, the Faulkner County judicial system, uh, for four years, again, after my dad had been murdered. Um, and I had gone at the same time to handle what was happening in my life, uh, therapy. Um, and over four years, I finally graduated and um, my therapist had suggested that I, you know, write a book. Um, and anyway, I moved to Park City and found some time to dedicate to like reclaiming my life and to go through what had happened to it. And um, the material was all there. I just, I needed help. And so I searched out and found Michael and uh, we talked on the phone and, you know, I just think he's an incredible human and I really enjoyed his perspective and the time that we spent together. It was like a, a whole another therapeutic process um, just to have the information from the the FOIA request and have his point of view um, of the legal system that it's different when you have a prosecuting attorney giving you information. Um, they're going to give you what they need to give you versus having somebody who has nothing to gain except you know to help you. And so Michael really helped me gain a better understanding of the things that had happened, maybe why it happened, here's a different perspective um, on it. So I could just kind of come to terms, you know, with those things, you know, for example, you know, the courtroom, I got kept out of the courtroom. I didn't actually know that was a thing. Um, it's still kind of hard to, to swallow. Um, you know, I just thought it was like the movies where you get to sit on the front row and, cry if you want to cry and be emotional if you want to be emotional. I mean, that's just what I thought how it happened. And that's just not how it happens. Um, and as it's a, very painful. Yeah. It's yeah, a very painful I, process. No, what's going to happen. You know, and the last thing you're expecting is, Oh no, you can't be in here. You're going to bring sympathy from the jury. And I'm like, well, naturally my dad's murdered. Of course I am. So there's, that's where the book came from. So your book is out now. Um, how has it been received in the sense, have you heard from someone where it was, you know, a total surprise or a healing moment? I have heard from many different people on, uh, through Facebook, uh, people that know my dad or knew my dad, uh, people that I grew up with, uh, people, you know, family, friends, um, each person has thanked me for writing it, uh, said I was strong and brave and courageous. Um, so that's been really nice at, at the, I had a book signing at the Faulkner County library and, you know, I really didn't know what to expect when I went back home. Um, but I was, very thankful for the support that I received uh, and a gentleman who actually worked in the police department, you know, came up and apologized to me for how long it took, um, how political the decisions were that were made. Um, and I was so grateful to hear that from him. Um, so on the one hand, it's really weird to promote the demon in disguise because it's such a sensitive, gut-wrenching subject for me. Um, but on the other hand, just talking with people about it has been healing for, for me. So and if it helps other people, I think that that's a wonderful thing. I hope it does. So where can people find the book and where can people follow either of you on social media or just keep up on what's going on as a result of this? 
So the book is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And uh, my website is ashleyelliottauthor.com. Um, of course, I have a Facebook page and I really like Instagram. So if you want to really keep up with me, that's <laughs> I like to take pictures. So that's where that is. Great. And Michael, uh, where can our listeners and viewers find you or follow you? Uh, probably best way is through my website, michael at michaelcafino.com. Or they can write me directly at michael at michaelcafino.com. You know, so, Terrific. You know, Thank yeah. you both for taking us um, through this journey of truly justice delayed. And sadly, justice is never truly fair. It just, it never is. But thank you so much. You've given us great perspective. It's been a pleasure having you on. Uh, you can find our other episodes uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Of course, you can subscribe to True Crime Daily uh, YouTube channel. Plus, you can subscribe to our newsletter. Until next time, I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. All right.